I hope you're prepared for an unforgettable luncheon. Before we get on to reaching Babel Tower, we check in once more with the floating heads of the Gazelle Ministry, then meeting with Corellin, where it's revealed that their abduction of Emeralda was done with intent to use her nanomachine colony as a means by which to reconstruct their bodies, which were destroyed during the conflict with Shavad 500 years ago, though Corellin denies them that chance as he has other plans for her. After all, them existing in this floating tech bowl is their punishment for turning against the path of their creator in their own greed, that they now only are faithful to in order to get back their independent forms. And I'm presuming there isn't enough knowledge in the form of synthetics technology for them to, say, make robot cyborg duplicates of their prior forms for them to have used in the interim instead. I mean, we have giant robots and a bunch of genetic monsters in this setting, and as I said, Ramses is a botched, discarded clone of Solaris' Emperor Kane, so it's odd they never considered just cloning themselves and having their consciousnesses downloaded into the copies, or alternatively trying to use high-end Solarians as host bodies themselves. Granted, as we will be seeing in a bit, they do have a plan to download themselves into other fleshy forms, it's just the most obvious ways to go around this they don't actually end up doing. Anyways, on to Babel Tower, which is absolutely ridiculous to climb up. The area requires you to use jumping mechanics near constantly to scale up the structure, and doing so is a right pain, especially due to its crumbling state of being. Granted, it's actually impressive the damn thing survived the last 10,000 years as intact as it has. As the tower? Yeah, it's actually the crashed primary hull of the Eldridge's forward section that speared itself into the land. Considering such impacts usually result in gigantic craters, and in some artistic drawings of said world map, it does look like the tower is sticking out of a massive impact crater where an entire continent had been broken up into a bunch of small islands. Thus, it really just goes to show how utterly massive that colony ship was before it was destroyed, even if it did fracture into pieces scattered across the planet. As is explained later, Shavat was originally founded at the top of the hull by those fleeing Solarian persecution 800 years ago, as ironically hiding in the sky like the Sky Dwellers themselves allowed them to avoid the persecution by Solaris for a few hundred years before things escalated into the war that happened. But by that point, Shavat was able to retrofit their city into being able to depart from its perch atop the tower, and away from Solarian forces to survive to this day. If only it were so easy to actually climb up the damn thing to actually be able to signal them. As if one isn't being careful or is not capable with their jumps, you're going to be spending a lot of time reclimbing the area, and consequently burning a lot of gear fuel when one ends up dealing with the random encounters of the region. To say nothing of the few progression puzzles the game throws at us to complicate the climb, as we have to get around obstacles caused by the place literally falling apart. And then there's suddenly these assholes blocking our path up as well. How did they even know we were coming here now, anyways? Did Graf tell them after hijacking the knowledge from Khan? I get the feeling that this is the point where the storyline is basically becoming boss battles for the sake of having a boss battle. As even in story, they say that Ramses and Miang should not have known they were going to be here, and nothing they do end up mattering as they just flee without any exposition at all. If anything, it would have been better had we fought an automated defense drone, which is what we technically end up doing anyways later in the climb against the Mecha the Saibzen. Though it isn't quite an automated drone, but a gear commanded by our next party recruit, Maria Balthazar granddaughter of Old Man Balthazar we met far earlier in the game that was living in that cave network. 
She's also the girl that Jesse was looking for all this time, though thanks to translation inconsistencies, my apologies once again, Richard Honeywood, but it feels like it's true when going through this, but also inconsistencies in the writing of the game, so that's the defense for him, it really doesn't come off as that the best way, but is what the storyline ends up eventually saying about this all. Once again, the story is not complicated, it is just poorly told. After we fight her giant robo-inspired super mecha, Zephyr, the Queen of Shavat, orders her to stop. Their tests have it concluded and consequently bring us aboard Shavat to meet with them and get more concrete explanations than we've had. That I am myself have been doing earlier on in this. Though before we even get to that, we do meet amicably with Maria, so we're good with her before anything else can start. And we are encouraged to explore the entire town to find a bunch of secret items that burn a few... many hours of our precious, precious time. Though things end up going exceedingly sus for me when not only is Khan and his wise men guys already here, but as we meet with Queen Zephyr, we learn that she is also over 500 years old. Yeah, biological immortality in settings like this usually do not lead to endearing things. Well, okay, it kind of worked with Melia and Nia in Xenoblade 3, but Xenoblade 3's concept of time is all sorts of wonky, as it just does not want to admit it's operating under simulation theory, which would explain every inconsistency with Xenoblade 3's setting. To their credit, they do say that such life extension treatments have been performed for the sole reason of keeping their civilization stable in response to the threat that is Solaris, and to atone for them screwing up in the war half a millennia ago that led to the current status quo. Khan has been helping them, at least when he's not taken over by Graf, which is why he's in his own way been nudging them toward Shavat as well as helping them gather allies for the next push forward in resolving the conflicts and bringing down Solaris's tyranny. Which we are pretty much on board with, considering nearly everyone here has ended up a victim or woken up to the country's cruelty. Though Faye does voice my own concerns that, well, we're not being given much of a reason to believe that these people are not just as bad, and using their quote-unquote victimization by Solaris to excuse their insurrectionist activities before claiming power for themselves. However, Solaris has somehow managed to get past Shavat's defenses to stage an attack on them, an infiltrator having shut down their shield generators. So gears, wells, and infantry are just pouring in, leaving us to deal with that and defend the city's generators, at least once we can get to our gears, which are at a hangar at the bottom of the city ship. And to get back to them, we have to travel through the ventilation shafts with Maria acting as our guide. This once more acts as a level catch-up region, allowing us to get used to Maria as a party member. And fortunately for Maria, she has neither AP attacks or death blows, just ether abilities revolving around her robots. So she's basically just a dedicated robot-partnered player character. And considering the grinding problem of this game, and the relative power of her machine, that isn't necessarily a bad thing, as she's just a dedicated mech gunner. But honestly, by this point in the game, I was just so fucking tired of the combat system of this game, and just how obnoxiously long every battle took, even when I was overleveled, that the entire time I was in this region, I just kept skipping the battles, as the mechanics of the monsters in this stretch were so fucking annoying with how much damage they could tank. And you're forced to have Maria in the party throughout this while she doesn't have her giant robot, which consequently makes her dead weight. Xenogears, where you're given a bunch of party members with purportedly interesting battle mechanics that you will have no interest nor incentive to be using over the first three characters you ever recruited. Eventually, we find the Elements members trying to steal Maria's Saibzen from the hangars. Since the machine was originally a super-strong Solaris prototype powered by a device called an Anima Relic. Though the Saibzen's possession of an Anima Relic is a detail in the story later retconned. The Anima Relics being other devices that are designed to interface and draw power from the Zohar to enhance the machines they're plugged into. Though despite them acting as a power source... 
For some reason, the machines they're plugged into still require fuel to run. For some reason. Domina, who we have met earlier among the Element members, tries to break Maria's spirit by blaming a bunch of Solaris' atrocities upon what Maria's father, Nikolai, enabled them to do. Having used the wells as a means by which to create a greater human-machine interface, with almost no lag between operator and movement by the machines. And most of that is a lie, or at least a extreme distortion of the truth. For Nikolai is not behind the creation of the wells as Domina claims here, and the experiments he did to improve gear technology was done under the duress after Solaris kidnapped him, Maria, and Maria's mother Claudia a decade before the recent events. Solaris' leader ordering him to do it, lest his wife and daughter suffer the consequences. Which did end up coming to pass, for said overseers used Claudia as a test subject, which constantly drove Nikolai mad with grief. Before he fell into the insanity of their indoctrination, he managed to complete a non-body horrific version of the interface, which was installed into the Cybzen, which he subsequently programmed to return Maria home and to safety, before subsequently succumbing to Solaris' brainwashing into the madman Domina talks of, which once more informs the lie, as people from Solaris always state that these corrupt monsters are their default, that who they are now, and always who they were, which ignores the reality of their history, and why they became like that when such was in contradiction to what they were originally. People don't necessarily stay the same throughout their lives. They can become better. They can become worse. They can hide the truth of who they are, or they can be an honest and consistent person. But to ignore the why of their actions is to ignore the truth of who they are. And in this case, a good man was turned malicious solely because he was consumed by this monstrous system that Solaris has engineered. Thus, any sin Domina blames on him, it is their own originating sin they inflicted upon him, as this was not all done under his own free will, but through brainwashing, drugging, and duress. But Domina was trying to break Maria for a reason with her distortions, as Claudia's death happened as she was attempting to be interfaced with the Cybzen making this an Evangelion sort of situation, where the machine can only be controlled by someone who shares a parent and child relationship with the one whose essence was originally mapped onto it. So without Maria, the mech's entirely worthless to either faction. This was not made any easier as the second wave of Solaris' forces come in, led by Nikolai, who in his Solaris-caused indoctrination has fused himself into the Cybzen sibling unit, the Oxzen requiring the assembled team to fend in separate battles the aforementioned generator units from these specialist assaults. And Margie's pet Choo coming in at this point to give us just this, well, burst of insanity. Magic wand make by me grow? I just... what? That's all I have here. Just what? Now, admittedly, this isn't entirely out of nowhere. Choo Choo's been around for a bit on this stage and talking about a super magical rare growth spurt. And after Choo Choo grows giant, it is revealed by Nikolai that Choo Choo is of a race that has the natural power to do this, that the Gazelle Ministry tried and failed to exterminate due to the danger these giants pose to them. But I really don't think anyone was expecting this to be what they were referring to. And narratively at the time this happens, we are in the midst of a story event where any gear not powered by an anima relic has been disabled. So Maria needed some form of backup for this fight that she's going into with severe conflicted feelings, considering the revelations about Nikolai that have only recently taken place. But as I said, much of the way Domino related that information is a distortion. For as the battle takes place, Nikolai comes off as being just as drug-addled as those Solarian gear pilots that use Drive. 
And consequently, once Maria stands up to the twisted version of her father, does she knock loose his sense? And the persona that hasn't been mind-screwed by Solaris is briefly allowed to surface, permitting them to have final words, and Nikolai releasing the restraint locks on the Saibzen's hidden weapon system that can utterly annihilate the Oxzen and other Solaris weapons he forged. And to avoid the problems around how the events with Billy were handled, the story is up front with Nikolai's uncorrupted true self to have been given the time to remotely back itself up into the Saibzen's databanks. So, in a way, her dad will always be looking out for her as long as she and the Saibzen are together. And they likewise handle this in the way I wanted Billy to, for Maria hesitates to fire, the Nikolai's essence in the Saibzen convincing the machine to do it against her orders, destroying his corrupt self, and ending the assault on Shavat. After this, we meet with Zephyr again, who explains that we can't go off to assault Solaris until three gates, essentially massive systems that help hide Solaris in a folded dimension space isolated from the rest of the world, are destroyed. One of which is under Ethos HQ, which Shavat cannot reach. But the other two they have no idea where to find yet. And they don't have the time to look for them now, as at this point, Nissan is also under attack by Ava, as consequence of Bard and Company's actions far earlier in the game against Shakan. And considering that was... Ooh, let me see... 30 hours ago of game time, when Shakan was last in any way relevant, you can be forgiven for getting such was a potential danger to Bart's earlier plans to liberate his homeland. And incidentally, you all remember those two items I told you about Nissan merchants selling that can be early game power boosting items? Yeah, your opportunity to purchase them is now gone. So if you were in any way interested in a healing and spell boosting accessory, I hope the cash got spent earlier, if you even bothered playing this game yourself. But odds are high that you wouldn't have even had the money to purchase them at this point in the game either. I certainly didn't. So what's even the fucking point? Fortunately, Shavat has given us a bit of a boost to getting back there. And by the time we return to the Yggdrasil, the Shavat engineers have already upgraded it to be able to fly around the map as the Yggdrasil 3. And consequently giving us our airship for the game as well. And while it is repetitive, I do nonetheless like that for most of the game, we were operating from the same home base the entire time. One of the things that drove me nuts about earlier Final Fantasy games is that if you left one of your transports somewhere and you forgot where it was, then good luck getting any form of easy travel over the landmasses. Here, it's hard to forget where you parked the soul ship you've made use of throughout the game, as you will be stuck on the same landmass as it. So yeah, we get to fast track it back to Nissan, at least as soon as I figure out how to navigate with this stupid frickin' airship. There is a reason I tend to hate games with large open overworlds. I get so freaking lost when I can't apply my real-life spatial awareness skills. So eventually we get to Nassan and find the city deserted except for the invading troops. Bart telling us that there's a secret bunker under the mausoleum above town where the people have likely hidden out. Which of course leads to what one might expect. The story finally resolving the Fatima Jasper story points from early in the game. But here's where we do see part of the story compression thanks to the lost development time start to rear its head as suddenly we begin to have tracks of narration summarizing the interim events, just to speed up sections of the story along, where obviously there's been nothing constructed to actually play through. Now, for the most part, this is fine. The story has needed compression to parts of it as it is. I am literally recapping 15 hours of game per video again with the reviews I am producing of the Xeno series at this point, as there's that much storyline decompression taking place here. And for the most part, it just allows us to skip straight to the mausoleum, where the secret of Bart's family has been hidden. That secret being Bart's own mech upgrade, the Andavari, which is another gear that is powered by an anima relic that can only be unlocked by Margie and Bart's eyes. The two Fatima Jaspers 
being their hereditary eye color. And with them being the last of their lines, it's why killing either of them would have locked this treasure off for good. The entire facility it was stored in actually being one of the escape pods from the original Eldridge that had been previously recovered by past civilizations. But unburying this ship lets Shikan and the Atone agents working with him right into the facility, leading to another confrontation with the Mad Priest, who exposits that yes, like Stone from earlier, he was using the Banner of Ethos to grab power in his own way, hoping that if he were able to eventually take the Anvari hidden here, and the Anvari being one of the legendary Omni Gears, that he could even topple Solaris to rule the world. I mean, we're getting there with help from it, but kinda takes more than one powerful weapon to end a subjugative war. You need the right pilot for it, for one, and the Anvari is useless without Bart. To that end, Shikan again abducts Margie so Bart can unlock the Anvari for used against him, only for Sigurd to come in and reveal that he too is a member of Bart's family and is in fact his elder half-brother, born from an affair Bart's father had long before Bart was born, who had chosen to keep this secret all this time. And I'm not annoyed by this revelation, even though it kind of does seem cliché. It was established that Sigurd was keeping things from Bart, and they didn't come off as having a master-servant relationship without Sigurd had watched over Bart all this time. The unknown half-sibling thing makes sense and deepens the sense of their relationship, one that did not need to be said. Hell, when he's allowed to elaborate on it, Sigurd did grow up in a loving home, so it's not like he was ever in the mind to say, usurp the throne or been part in Patsy to Shikan's schemes. But it is kind of obnoxious that every character here has some form of secret or projected lie about them, which inevitably ties them to Solaris. Like, we get it. Solaris and who they support are the bad guys in every way, shape, and form. But it's getting excessive with how it's being hammered in that every event that went wrong in their lives inevitably comes from them or an agent of them. Shikan tries to use Margie to move the Anvari, but fails as the gear uses a human-machine interface similar to the Cybzen. And since Margie's not been trained in gear piloting, cannot use it. Bart, after a fashion, can, and we manage to seize the gear back from Shikan's attempts to steal it, leading to a boss battle with the Atone Gears that gives one a better idea of what an Omni Gear can do. And it's basically just the same as Bart's previous gear. Yeah, part of the problem with the Omni Gears in this game is, well, functionally they are no different than the initial mech the characters have. Hell, due to time constraints in the back half of the game, Several of the base mechs are just given an anima relic as a power source later on, and the base mech is then counted as one. It makes their value as a machine feel more intangible, despite their plot importance in moving things towards resolution. But Shikan, in his recurring incompetence, has ended up fleeing to the location of the second Solaris Gate we needed to find and subsequently destroy. The irony being that Shikan was originally on the ground to guard this facility, and fell into taking advantage of everything else to rise in power as he did, far beyond the station of his own competence. And that is again shown as Shikan tries to use the energy that powers the gate to supercharge his own gear, beyond what he believes that Omni Gear can actually handle. But in reality, this is truly showing how stupid Shikan is, as not only is he trying to defeat the Omni Gear that he's spent the entirety of this plot trying to claim, thinking he can make something more powerful in it, thus defeating the purpose of why he would even want it in the first place, but the energy he's draining from the gate, yeah, it's risking destabilizing it so badly that it would destroy itself. Thus, yeah, no, the man is an object failure at every task handed to him, and his power only propped up by the military might of those backing him, just like it is of every fascist dictator. Break the cult, you break the man. Show the man who prides himself on power and guile as the weak, incompetent fool he is, and his supporters 
who are not complete sycophants, will abandon him or eat him alive. And the reason this is proof of that is... It doesn't work. Hell, him attempting it actually freezes his machine. It's only because of Graf coming in and giving him a power-up that so suddenly does work. But as a mechanic, it only means that his machine gets healed up every time he connects to the gate's reactor. Though he ends up doing it frequently enough that it becomes a pain when it comes to the actual boss battle, due to the amount of health Shikan's gear has, which I can actually call by a third every attack by just spamming Ellie's erods in battle. Yeah, I've not brought it up since it was introduced, but Ellie's Vurge gear is one of the consistent best damage dealers in the game, to the point your damage rate is significantly hard when she's not around, which ends up happening in the last section of the game. While you have her, though, keep her in the party! Though me using her so liberally is probably why it took me forever to learn about infinite attack levels. As the games progressed, you've been allowed to build up more and more of a battle gauge, for the gears that allows them to do stronger attack chains. But the missing turns to build them up have just never seemed worth it to me. If an attack level that is introduced is possible now, and with Omni Gears, changes that, as it breaks that previous damage limit that had made so many battles in here obnoxious. The thing is though, outside of the last few bosses in the game, I don't remember doing them at any point to beat anything else. Primarily because the strategy you have to utilize to beat mech-based bosses usually involves hitting them hard enough and fast enough before they can bring out their wicked crap. And hard and fast usually doesn't endear one's thought processes to don't attack at all and charge up your supers even if that gives your enemy an advantage to hit you hard enough to possibly die. As that means of going about this, can end up with a dead unit just at the point that you'd be able to unleash their supers. And don't tell me it's not. I've been playing JRPGs for over 20 years, and I can't name the number of times from this and the early PS2 era where that crap happened. But yeah, thanks to the power of Ellie's Wisp Bit Funnel Dragoons, Shikan goes down so hard that the gate reactor destabilizes, and the entire facility is blown sky high. With Shikan's death, Ethos and Solaris evacuate Ava. Bart coming in to finally take the throne. Declare he is calling for peace with Kislev to end their centuries of conflict and aggression. And also that he's abdicating the throne and turning Ava into a republic for the people, by the people. So this religious manipulation of rule can never happen again. Unless the people are so religiously blinded by everything, they elect a con man into office that claims to be of their religion, but in truth embodies all the sins they are supposed to condemn. But what are the odds of that happening again, after they just overthrew that corrupt bastard, right? In truth, this was one of the last wishes of Bart's father, who had become so disillusioned with the monarchy that he wanted to get rid of it but was prevented from doing so by the war and the needs of his station. It's actually why the situation with Sigurd happened. Bart's father loved Sigurd's mother, but Bart came about because of a relationship born of solely politics. Thus, Bart feels like he's doing the right thing in ending the need for a royal line to rule. So a situation like Sigurd and Bart have would never happen nor the need arise that they would fight over the throne if Bart proved himself a poor leader for his people. But even voicing this, he's shown that he possesses the will of an honorable ruler. Seriously, while it started off rocky, Bart really does end up being the best character in the game to me. It's probably why a lot of his arc ended up later uprooted and redone with Zeke in Xenoblade 2, just with more campy humor to his character. With Ava back in their hands and Kislev, for the most part, agreeing to the ceasefire, that just leaves our attention focused on finding the last gate before taking on Ethos HQ. From Shikan's own notes on the matter, he's found that the last gate has to be in a triangular configuration with the other two to properly create the space-time warp around Solaris. Because it's always triangulation about these sorts of things. If you have projectors projecting something towards a singular point, then they usually have to be in equilateral formations with the others to be the most efficient at doing whatever task is at hand. 
It's just a recurring physics versus geometry thing. And the structure that is equilateral with both the Ethos HQ and the previous Gate Cave in Ignis is the... Babel Tower? Uh, I took another look at the map, and no, it's really not. Actually, this is the game poorly conveying its meaning again. The pod that housed the Invari, now referred to as Fort Jasper, was shown earlier to have a ridiculously powerful energy cannon as one of its defenses. And they've once more confirmed that the second gate installation is buried deep under Ethos HQ, which is right by the Tower of Babel. Because the tower is part of the remains of the Eldridge, it has giant reflectors used as part of its point defense network still on it. So if they can change the angle of the reflector, then the cannon on the Fort Jasper can be reflected to be fired at and dig under the Athos HQ to destroy the gate generator without having any need to get close. Thus, it requires a return trip to the Babel Tower to do just that, where we in turn have a bunch of straight battles with all of Solaris' element agents and their mecha. And at least this time, we get an explanation on why they're there, as the Gazelle Ministry could tell what they were likely planning to do, just from the observations of what happened with Shikan and the first gate facility's destruction, and are likewise not happy with Ramses for allowing it, thus resulting in the full deployment of his elite units this time as well. These boss battles are a pain, as there are just a consecutive marathon of conflicts as you have to fight the Element Girls four separate times in rapid succession. And to give an advanced warning on this, Ellie's various weapons, the element rods, can end up healing said characters due to their elemental alignments. And Ellie's rods also affect the elemental affinity and specialties of her gear. The only one of Ellie's rods that doesn't give her this disadvantage ends up being Ellie's flare rod. So that needs to be equipped to her before the battle starts unless you want to have a bad time. Fortunately, the four battles are split up between two sets of characters each, matching the two locations they're fighting at. As, well, let's face it, it'd be silly for all of them to converge on just the mirror facility, when they could just destroy the means of transmitting the beam. Then again, destroying or damaging the mirror controls in an all-out assault might have been the safer avenue, but again, no guarantee they couldn't just find another way. So it makes as much sense to split the party going to either location, as there's no simple way to win this one for them. This is no simple walk to Mordor. The team sent after the cannon does get it to misfire, thus where the second ride of battles originates from. But with the second shot, the plan succeeds, and the second generator facility is taken out. This leaves only two triangulated locations where the last generator could be but there's uncertainty on which way to go. None of the Solaris defectors have any idea of where the country is located in relation to the ground. The transport gates to and from Solaris completely disorient the travelers, so there's no frame of reference planet side to where it geographically is. Thus, the last gate generator could either be in the Fronis in North, or deep beneath the sea. Huh... Well, Solaris' forces have had no presented presence in the Plantic's Arctic regions. But they did attack a deep-sea excavation vessel, so I put my bets on it being in that Sargasso they pointed out in this scene. It makes sense from a tactical standpoint as well, as it would require a certain tech level to even reach down there, which Solaris is deliberately keeping the land dwellers from reaching under normal circumstances. Hell, even destroying the second generator of the three required the cast to use precursor tech that predates Solaris' civilization. Thus, they didn't have a viable defense against that. And sure enough, that is where it is. This being the point of the game that the themes is given any appropriate reference in the story 2 existing. But once more, it doesn't exist for its own sake or for things to occur there, but as a story device. It's there to service some other part of the plot, but not for their own relevance to what is going on. The relevance in this case of why the Thames exists is just to reinforce our equipment so it can survive deep-sea exploration that our ship and gears aren't suited for yet. 
Most mobile weapons platforms obviously don't plan for the kinds of stress and pressure that is down there, unless they're made of extremely strong armor to begin with, like Gundanium, or have phase shift armor coating them where the point of them is stress resistance. Though we get a cutaway to the Gazelle Ministry again, where they can't do anything but blame Ramses for incompetence when... they're not doing anything themselves. With Corellan being up there talking to them, and suggesting that they should place all the faith for their continuance on the mother that created them, who has been stuck in the same cycle of reincarnation as Faye and Ellie, thinking they can best draw them out by the creation forged by the Contact, aka Faye, and the Anti-Type, their reference for how Ellie's reincarnations have been viewed as. And that creation, of course, being the aforementioned Emeralda. Yeah, Corellan has gotten all he can out of experimentation with Emeralda's nanite-infused body, so putting a slave program on the artificial life form to have it attack the reincarnation of its, or rather, her parents, can only result in good in their eyes. Especially to the immense reaction to it Ellie was shown to have before, and how much of her past life's memories we awakened in her just by being in proximity to Emeralda. So we head to the Thames to get the units all kitted out for underwater exploration, and head down into that Sargasso. And I immediately despise navigating down here. Seriously, the only thing that is worse than sewer levels in video games? Because there always is, for some reason, no matter how much we despise them, has to be underwater levels. While they don't appear as much these days, there's a reason for it. For those who might not have been alive or active gamers at that time, so many developers in this and the PS2 era loved trying to figure out underwater and swimming mechanics for games that did not centrally focus around them. And even the ones that were based around them all inevitably fell prey to the fact that there was just not a competent execution of such mechanics. At best, you'd get a boat racing game like Hydro Thunder that might be able to do something passable. But stuff like this? Yeah, it didn't really work. Worse for me is this is once more a dungeon that I get fucking lost in. But at least this time I have a better excuse because just, well, look at these caves. Because of how they've visually been designed, the walls of the cavern and the pass through them at several points look virtually indistinguishable from each other. And with the point of view camera as always on a freewheeling gimbal, me reorienting my perspective without any frame of reference just as quickly leads me to getting turned around and going right back the way I came with almost no awareness I did so. The Xenogears experience summed up in four words. I am so lost! We eventually get to the last gate and face Emeralda, who, as said before, has been reprogrammed by Corellan to being just an attack drone, and attacking us with an armless and yet head-winged mech. It would not surprise me if this mech was used as an inspiration for the high end tier race in Xenoblade, as was the way the wings are patterned, creating ideas for others that would eventually result in the Freedom Gundam's flight unit. Her mech, the Crescens, is pretty powerful, all things considered, but with her being the last recruited party member, we don't have that much time with her that makes it to that much of our benefit. Though even fighting Emeralda frees her from the reprogramming, as their instructions were not able to fully suppress the memory modules that make Emeralda recognize Faye as the reincarnation of her creator. Though due to Emeralda having the mentality of a child, she can't really distinguish what a reincarnation is, just seeing Faye fully as Kim, since she detects him as being the same person. But with Emeralda's defeat and the withdrawal of Solaris from our way, the last gate generator has now been destroyed, exposing for the world the Tower of Solaris that leaves it suspended over the planet. Unfortunately, there is one last generator inside Solaris that is keeping a defensive barrier over the country that will still prevent it from being attacked, but that can be destroyed by Maria and the Saibzen's Parkle Cannon, so it will be a team of Faye, Ellie, as she knows the lay of the land, and Satan, for the same reason, 
that will be infiltrating the civilization to destroy this last generator and get Maria in to blast it. This is again why Elmerald as a character addition feels, well, pointless, despite her being a gynoid character, having racked as an archetype for Cosmos and Telos, as this would have been a good time for her to act as a character, with her unique skills shown as an asset to this infiltration, thus warranting such. And instead, we're taking with us the first characters we recruited. Now again, there was probably intended for there to be more to her to do and be involved in with what was originally planned for the game, but we're not that far from where the story summarization starts up, so there's not a lot for her to do or be involved in. Though, remember when I said Satan's kept secrets that just weren't relevant to reveal at the times in the game? Yeah, that's all coming to a head soon, since all the secrets he has left tie themselves to that continent. Satan's wife, Yui, giving him a capabilities upgrade by returning to him a sword he's refused to use for a long time that changes up his moveset. Fortunately, the Saib Zen is still classed by Solaris defenses as a Solarian unit, thus it transporting the infiltration team onto its external structure isn't a problem, and we're able to find an external hatch that allows them inside. Likewise, assisted by gravity plating, the structure uses to permit the maximum amount of occupants inside its structure, regardless of physical orientation. This lets us into the lowest levels of Solaris. In specific, it's prisoner and third-class worker facilities, where people abducted from the surface, as discussed before, are conscripted to work for the Solarians to meet their labor needs. This including several familiar faces, like one of the competitors from the Ava Battle Tournament. This guy... Samson, has already found a way to escape the worker levels. So we follow him out, only for him to try and pass a security door, and for him to be turned assault as punishment for trying to leave. Ellie can still get through, as her going traitor has not been reported to the system to flag her as an illegal entrant, so Faye staying close to her lets him pass unhindered. We learn once we're on the main level that the gate's dropping has not gone unnoticed. The Gazelle Ministry and Emperor Kane planning a rally to quell the unrest of the masses. By claiming, This was all they're doing! No reason to be alarmed! Things are going to plan! Please ignore the evidence of your own eyes and believe only what we order you to believe! Which is, as always, the obfuscation of reality performed by tyrants in autocratic fascism, and those that enable it. Starting to understand why this game was considered too dark to be a Final Fantasy game at the time? Unfortunately, this speech is all a prelude to them invading and destroying everything on the surface. So we need to find that generator fast, so the country loses its invulnerability. But Kane and Corellan have rightfully guessed that we've infiltrated causing us to lose time on that pursuit via needing to hide out with Ellie's family, as they spread the lie that we're here to kill Kane himself. Which is all to cover the lie that the Ministry is intending to do that themselves, having captured the rest of our companions off-screen, where they intend to dispose of them in the Soylent system. And that... that's about where I just felt... Done with this game. As coincidentally, I was recording this footage in 2022. The 1973 film, Soylent Green, is a dystopian future story set in 2022, starring Charlton Heston, yes, Planet of the Apes, Charlton Heston, about the dangers of overpopulation in a hyper capitalist culture hindering the capacity for a society to grow, with just the masses of individuals not having any point or purpose or ability to gain a job to feed themselves, and the sheer number of individuals detrimentally harming the sustainability of our capacity to grow food. Attention is becoming critical. It's a powder keg waiting to go off in an explosion of unacceptable behavior. Don't bitch to me, boss man. Thanks to the latest budget cuts, I'm down to using grade F meat. Now, a lot of the film's content was grossly mistaken. Hypercapitalist societies actually suppress population numbers after a certain point, where businesses buy out the services of political representatives, by which they then garner favor to deregulate things in the corporation's favor. As past that point, 
Those living in one are so desperate to meet their basic needs and comforts that they completely avoid having children as they cannot afford to have them. This best epitomized by Japan's population collapse over the last few decades, and how America's population rates only stay consistent thanks to immigration. As, yeah, the various economic disasters the last two decades, alongside minimum wage rates staying well below the rates of a livable wage, and various Republicans suppressing any national or statewide efforts to improve compensation or housing, or stopping price gouging making things far more expensive than they should be, or cracking down on the acts of scam artists to steal money, and so on and so forth, and you have a recipe for disaster as all that shit does not make for a system that allows for a sustainable population or population growth. It in fact causes the opposite, as the less time one has for a personal life, the less of a chance you'll meet a significant other you would like. So, toxic corporate culture is inevitably leading to our own self-destruction. This is something that could not have been accounted for at the time of Southern Green's make as a film, as again, 1973. Most of the truly disastrously bad decision making, including drug crises, the gutting of mental health support, the refugee crisis of those fleeing from dictatorial regimes America put in power, and economic deregulation that screws us over today, came about from the Reagan administration in the 1980s, and that has only gotten worse since then, because most of those policies have still not been reversed, only compounded. You look at the history of why things are awful now, and you can almost always chart it back to regressive conservative rhetorics that began in the 1980s, or began to really be pushed by politicians in the 1980s. But the entire point of why Soylent Green was written the way it was, was at the time, it was believed untethered capitalism would encourage people to have kids just so they could have more and more consumers to buy more and more of their wares, to achieve the dream of an endlessly growing market, as thanks to the baby boom earlier in the decades, that's what they believed was going to happen. And that's why the movie then depicted the result of that being an overpopulated planet where there are ultimately finite resources. The reverse actually ended up being true for practically the same reasons. The movie then centers its plot around the actions of the Soylent Corporation, which removes people from the overpopulated cities to transport them to work at facilities that provide food to the masses. Uh, Jimbo, why don't you assist Lunch Lady Doris in the kitchen? Bite me, Skinner. Well, might we? The mystery being, no one can figure out where those people go as they're never seen again, and what the food they provide is. With the ultimate twist of the film being... They're making our food out of people. Next thing, they'll be breeding us like cattle. Listen to me, Hatcher. You gotta tell them... Silent Green is people! Yeah, the Soylent Corporation was taking the people it employed and literally murdering them for the profit of capitalistic endeavors. Those blindly following the precepts of capitalism, literally eating their fellow man just to survive without care. And again, the film was set in 2022. So while the political message of the film remains intact to this day, its representation, however, has made it the butt of many jokes. What if the secret ingredient is people? No, there's already a soda like that. Soylent Cola. Oh. How is it? It varies from person to person. It varies from person to person. As well, despite the timetable for such being off, we're literally meeting several of the milestones the film depicted. But this system is not yet cannibalizing itself literally quite yet. And frankly, endless growth capitalism is not exactly something corporate businessmen or their political parties have ever shown themselves to actually want nor encourage. More and more, we keep seeing the richest men on the planet are seeking out get-rich-quick schemes where they forego long-term gains and sustainability that can benefit everyone, and center their actions centrally on maximizing whatever short-term gains they can get before running off in an attempt to escape the long-term consequences and the financial debt that is left behind. Why the short-term game was a bad idea in the first place. As time and again, 
we keep seeing people with all the money trying to stick those that don't have money with their bills and tax burdens instead of them paying their fair share. But why I just became done with this game at this point was just the sheer exhaustion I felt at the developments from this point on, as we get it at this point. So Laris, the Gazelle Ministry, and the Cults of Deus are outright evil and responsible for everything that is wrong in this planet. This has been beaten into our heads at every end, that they are evil and must be defeated. So there was no point to add literal cannibalism to everything else in here. And I mean that, literal cannibalism. Remember the wells I talked about earlier? It's at this point in the game we learn more about them, and the process by which they are created. The third-class citizens, aka the slaves taken from the surface, who refuse to serve as Solaris's manpower, are thrown out of the pens they're kept in, and dropped into research centers where they're experimented upon until they die, or are otherwise turned into wells, and from there are either unleashed upon the lower planet where they go out to kill other humans to state their unrelenting hunger, ones that meet the certain criteria turned into biomass for the reformation of Deus, or... Here comes the third option, reprocessed from the well state into the food the Solarians eat alongside the disposed bodies of the failed experiments. To tie it back to how this all started, lambs to the slaughter. <gasps> Are you saying you killed Jimbo, processed his carcass, and served him for lunch? And the game is not subtle about this. We literally see wells being made, and then being chopped up for food. The chemicals and mutagens they've been injected with, then ending up in the Solarian's diet. So who the fuck knows what is wrong with the entire population by this point? Hell, considering their docility towards indoctrination, who knows what else they've been drugged with along the way? And that isn't even getting into how actually terrible it is to use humans for meat, as in comparison to a lot of animals that could pile on the pounds of muscle that become meat to make it more economical and require the death of fewer of the animals to provide food, we comparatively have a lot less mass dedicated to our meaty bits. And we've seen the wells, how they barely seem to have muscle mass with how gaunt and zombie-like they look. So how many fucking people must they be using for this whole process, which then ends up consequently wasteful with regards to life and resources? If it was just humans to wells, wells to biomass for Deus, and Deus needs human biomass to regenerate itself because similarities to its own genetic structure, fine. But there's no reason to do the extra soylent step to it. Hell, the entire point of the soylent green film was it was a cautionary tale about not just hypercapitalism, but overpopulation. Soylent green treating the latter while enabling the former. But in Xenogears, the human population keeps getting culled and culled into smaller and smaller numbers where Solarians literally eating other people is unnecessary when they could literally just have farmland they grind those they kill up to fertilize. Humans make for a terrible fertilizer too, thanks to the bacteria that is naturally in our bodies, but it's more sensible than culling an already tiny population. Well, Seymour, you are an odd fellow, but I must say... You steam a good ham. Now, I get that the Solarians are not thinking straight to begin with. They are largely zealots that don't question what their emperor or his representatives or military officers tell them. So this isn't necessarily on them. But this feels like more of a writing issue where they just started to go too far to hammer in the point that this civilization is irredeemable. As we've mostly experienced personal atrocities and experiences that some might write off as just the actions of those at war, and miss that the Solarians are responsible for this war in the first place, as a means of occupying the surface dwellers against any enemy but themselves. But no other Xeno game goes this far, or at least none the same ways, for something that is ultimately meaningless to include, as they've already more than justified the need to end Solaris's tyranny, and what the Soylent system ties back to doesn't justify taking it this far. And yet, by not going this far unnecessarily, 
The other Xeno games better emphasize the purpose of why Xeno Gears did this by showing the sociopathy of those with power towards those less than themselves. Xenosaga's mass bioforming is a consequence of the villains maliciously chasing what they want, not the intended goal itself. What happened to the High Entia people in Xenoblade 1 was something not even they realized was true as they were all a means to an end by their creator to use them as weapons in a dispute with another false god. Even the cruelty of Mobius in Xenoblade 3 is largely predicated on maintaining what their leader refers to as the Endless Now. None of these are pointless additions in regards to the progression of the narrative, and end up majorly hinging aspects of their crises upon them. Whereas this cannibalism story point, it's the step too far for me where I just start to check out, as it really goes nowhere and does nothing to serve anything that happens later. Granted, it's not like there's a lot more of the game to get through now, as right here, where we are now, this is the last region we go through before the story summarization starts in earnest. So be ready for a lot of that when we next come back. got this really cheap when Toys R Us went out of business and before Hasbro took over the management of Power Rangers Legendary Collection items. It's actually really nice, but I am annoyed I just did not get the Zeonizer from that, considering how much I actually like Zeo. 